Today, we're pleased to welcome Ben Carney of UCLA Psychology Department, and he'll be speaking on gender differences and implications of physical appearance among married couples. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's been a few years since I've addressed your group, and it's a pleasure to be invited back. The, um, <clears throat> the issue at hand is almost, uh, it seems almost intuitive, almost a straw man that I'm going to give, uh, present for you today especially for this crowd. But uh, you'll see that there's been some, a, a point that perhaps hasn't been controversial in many, many years, was taken for, read, uh, taken for granted for many, many years, has been controversial in recent years. So sometimes there's a point that has been hammered home. You think that nail's been hammered into the ground. You just got to nail it one more time. And that's what I'm going to do today. So the question that uh, I'll present you with is, do, you, do men value physical attractiveness in a romantic partner more than women? And uh, for this crowd, I think most people would just say, well, duh, of course they do. Who would argue anything different? And uh, in fact, many, many people from many, many disciplines have made this point, suggesting that men, uh, the male of the, certainly the human species, and in fact of many species, but especially of humans, have evolved uh, sensitivity to and preferences for and a value of physical uh, attractiveness in a romantic partner and that this is more true in men than in women. So what's the argument? Well, the argument, again, I, I needn't belabor the point in this particular crowd, is, uh, uh, derives from parental investment theory, with the idea that uh, <clears throat> uh, both, both men and women who should have evolved preferences that help them solve reproductive challenges that are unique to their gender. And for men, one of those challenges is identifying mates who are fertile, and uh, for women, physical attractiveness is more closely tied to fertility than it is for men. So for men, uh, what makes a man attractive as a mate is not merely sort of uh, health, although health is one thing. So you would expect that physical appearance wouldn't be unimportant for women. It's just more important for men. It's a cue that they pay more attention to. Um, of the many people who've made this point, a typical example would be bus who, in some of his research, basically asked people, you know, what are your preferences? What are you looking for in a romantic partner? What uh, qualities do you value in a mate? And no matter where you go, no matter how you ask the question, men score higher in the importance of physical attractiveness in a mate than women. This is true in Western cultures. It is true in Eastern cultures. It is true in highly developed industrial societies. It is true in um, undeveloped uh, tribal societies. It's true everywhere. No matter where you ask the question, you get the same answer, which is a gender difference such that men value it more. So that should be the end of it. You'd think that would be the end of it. But recently, well, maybe not so recently, but there is a, an undercurrent within especially social psychology, and I'm a social psychologist, of questioning that finding. And uh, a lot of that work, the questioning work, comes from dating studies. So one of the first examples of this was way back at the beginning of dating research, 1966, when uh, Elaine Walster and her colleagues, now she, that she changed her name to Elaine Hatfield, but she's now known better as Elaine Hatfield, <coughs> did one of the first studies of um, uh, what pe looking at what people find attractive in a potential mate. And that's a kind of interesting study where she uh, got access to the entire incoming class at the University of, I think it was Minnesota, the entire freshman incoming class, and invited the entire freshman incoming class to a, da uh, a dance, like a mixer, a freshman mixer, and told all of those students that they had been assigned a partner at the dance based on questionnaires that they had filled out. In fact, all of the incoming class had filled out questionnaires, but those questionnaires were ignored in making the matches in, uh, much like modern dating services, the, um, uh, the match was made randomly. Uh, but they had the data on all of the people and their partners. So the question that they asked was, do you want to see this person again, sort of halfway through the dance? And they wanted to know what variables that they had measured about people's partners predicted whether those partners were attractive enough to want to be seen again. The number one predictor of whether someone wanted to see their randomly matched partner again was, as you might expect, physical attractiveness. 
and the physical attractiveness in that study had been rated. Uh, Hadfield and colleagues had gotten photographs of all the incoming class, shoulder up, headshots, and had had a group of undergraduates rate the physical appearance on a scale of, I think it was one to five. And it was not surprising that whoever was fortunate enough to be matched with an attractive person, physically attractive person, very high wanting to see that person again. What was interesting about that study is that the, um, the second most influential variable to predict those choices, can, can you guess? There was no second most influential variable. <laughs> nothing else predicted it at all. It was a trick, trick question. There was nothing else influential in the slightest. Only physical attractiveness mattered. And there were no gender differences. It mattered the same for males and females. <clears throat> Some decades later, Susan Sprecher, a uh, social psychologist in the sociology department at Iowa State, uh, did a similar kind of study where she asked male and female undergraduates, what do you think influences your choice of a mate? It was a really clever study. She asked him, what do you think influences your choice of a mate? And of course, the men said, I really like physical attractiveness. And women said, yeah, I like it, but I like it less. So men rated the importance of physical attractiveness higher than women did. But when she gave people folders describing different potential dates that they might go on, and then actually looked at what aspects of those folders that she manipulated predicted the choices of men and women, she found that men and women in the study, males and female participants, were equally affected by the physical attractiveness of the targets in the folders. There was no gender difference there. People thought there was a gender difference, but there was no gender difference predicting behavior. And the most recent example of this uh, kind of finding is from uh, Paul Eastwick and Eli Finkel's work. And they, these guys are social psychologists at, Nor uh, Finkel's at Northwestern. Eastwick was his student. They do work on speed dating. And if you're familiar with some of this work, it's really cleverly designed. And they ask people the same sort of standard question, what are you looking for in a mate? How important are these three things? And I think they, they specifically got the importance of like, ambition, drive, earning potential that you perceive in this person, physical appearance, and I think friendliness or sort of agreeableness was the third category there. And there were no gender differences in how you, much you value agreeableness. Everyone likes agreeable partners. But there were gender differences in people's ratings of how important physical appearance are, was and um, sort of ambition, drive, and earning potential was in the stereotypical direction that the men said, uh, I favor physical, I value, I'm looking for a physically attractive partner. And that was a high value for them. Women also valued physical attractive partners, but not as much. And they, they rated sort of ambition, drive more strongly than men did. What was interesting is that then people had a speed dating interaction where each individual interacted for like four minutes with every, like 10 other individuals in a room and rated, evaluated each of the people they spoke to on those three dimensions, agreeableness, likely earning potential, and physical appearance. Now, if the world makes sense, if people make sense, then if I tell you in advance of this interaction, I really care a lot about physical attractiveness. And then I rate everyone in a room about how physically attractive I think they are. And then you ask me the final dependent variable, which of these people do you want to see again? If I told you in advance I care most about physical attractiveness, and then I rate these people on their physical attractiveness, I should want to see again the person I rated as most physically attractive. But I didn't find that. Didn't find that at all. My ratings of what I thought was important to me in no way accounted for who I wanted to date after the speed dating event. That was true for males and for females. Uh, Alan. Do you want to take questions now or not? I'm comfortable taking questions. Jump in. In each of these three studies, you might have the same thing in common, at least the first and the last one do, which is <coughs> you know a lot about the person's physical appearance and not much about the other ones. If you're at a loud dance and maybe you can hardly talk to hear each other, you at least can see what each other look like. And uh, anyway, the same might be true of the other studies too, that you, you have good, reliable, solid data <coughs> on what they look like and less information on the other. So if you if you have good information about one variable and lousy information about another, then you pick, you know, you use the information that you have and 
can't do anything else. I think it's an excellent point, an excellent point. It's uh, an important critique, a relevant critique, of these three studies. It's, it's not the only way you could critique them. And I'm about to spend the next, you know, I'm going to critique them in, in many additional ways. But that was a good one. That um, these, this is, these are contexts in which, as Alan says, you have access to the uh, physical appearance. And you don't have as good access to some of the other variables. Question. In this last experiment, did you manipulate the order in which they asked the question? Less important to you? I don't know if they counterbalanced that. I'm guessing that they did. These are careful researchers. But I don't recall that detail from the article. Do you think that it would make a difference? If you ask uh, people after they have already made a choice, oh, oh. you find important. Well, that's, uh, that, okay, excuse me. that was very clear, that they asked people what they found important before, always before, never after. So they asked people in advance, what's your sta what is your feeling about what's important to you? And then they had the speed dating interaction. And then they were asked to evaluate everyone in the room after each interaction. And then at the very, very end, which of these 10 people would you want to see again in, for a date? And what they found was they didn't find what you sort of expect, the sort of rational idea that I think I, telling you physical attractiveness is important to me. Therefore, I want to see again the person I just rated as most physically attractive. They didn't find that. Yes, question. Did they ever think about, or could that be explained by uh, you know, recognizing that's an interesting, interesting idea. There's been, I, I don't think it's so relevant here because uh, you're just saying who you're interested in, and then, the, I mean, it's possible. It's, that's possible. There have been a lot of interesting work on the out of my league phenomenon, which I'm not going to get into here. But, and and there's, there's actually mixed, there's, it's a controversial point whether people kind of shoot for the stars or whether people adjust who they want to see based on their sense of their own league. But uh, that's, I'm not going to talk about that right now. <clears throat> Eastwick and Finkel have been uh, took, taking their data and sort of reviewing some of this research and are beginning to try to make a case that, in fact, the conventional wisdom about gender differences and preferences for physical attractiveness among in humans for romantic partners is, in fact, overblown is based on a, on a stereotype that people believe, but that may not actually be true. And, and to make this point, they sort of think back to uh, old social psychological work by Nisbet and Wilson saying, hey, people actually don't know what they want. They think they know. They can easily generate answers if you ask them, why did you choose what you chose? But people don't always know. What, why they chose what they chose. People are actually poor at, at generating insights into their own preferences. So they're saying, you know, people think that there's gender differences. Men think they care about it more than women think they care about it. You know what? In fact, we're all equally affected by gender differences. But it's possible that that conclusion, like before we overturn, decades and multiple disciplines worth of conventional wisdom, we would want to maybe take a closer look. And uh, that's what I've tried to do. So I'm reading that and thinking, boy, that's, there is multiple studies, but they all have a lot of things in common. What are some of the problems with the studies so far? Well, one problem I think Alan picks up on pretty uh, immediately, which is uh, you know, these are contexts where people don't have access to the other kinds of dimensions, but they have strong, easy access to physical attractiveness. So it makes sense that physical attractiveness is carrying the day. That doesn't mean that in other contexts, we might see the gender difference has been expected. More to the point, there's actually been, if you look closely at these studies, a disjunction between the self-report question that's asked and the context in which behaviors have been observed. So it, I think it's a great idea to ask self-reports and then observe behavior and see if it's consistent. But you have to ask about exactly what you're going to be behaving, and that hasn't happened. What people ask about in like the bus research, for example, and the Sue Sprecher research, and a lot of this research, is what is your ideal, what are the qualities in an ideal long-term partner in a serious relationship? You ask people, if you're looking for a serious relationship, what are the qualities you look for? And that was absolutely true in the bus research. There are 37 cultures, and it's true in all of this research. But if you think about the studies I just described to you, there's no assumption, and there's certainly we, it would be unjustified to presume that the people who are actually choosing partners in the speed dating study, in the mixer, 
or in the Sue Sprecher kind of computer dating study, that any of those people were thinking of long-term partners. In fact, it seems like just the opposite is true. Uh, looking back to the 1966 study, if you uh, just got to the University of Minnesota, you're a freshman, and you're at a freshman mixer, uh, uh, my advice to my own child would be, slow down. You don't need to find a long-term partner tonight. <clears throat> well, in fact, there's a lot of research that, that has manipulated short-term versus long-term orientation towards relationships. And when you actually try to manipulate that thing, it, you see that when you focus on short-term strategies, gender differences shrink a great deal in men and women. Uh, for short, and, and men, a lot of studies have shown that when women are practicing a short-term mating strat reproductive strategy or mating strategy, they care a lot about physical appearance in a mate. It's when you get to long-term strategies that you see that, you're, that, that the theory suggests you're going to see larger gender differences, because the costs in, of long-term mating are different for men and women. But that's not where it's been studied. It's been studied in all these dating contexts, because it's much easier to study college students who are dating than married people who are married and off campus. So the th the theory actually suggests that. If you're looking for gender differences in sort of behavior or with real context or real outcomes, you've got to look in the right place. And the right place isn't short-term relationships. It isn't dating. It's long-term relationships. So what kind of data would you want if you're really going to pin this down, try to re respond to this recent, this recent suggestion that there's the, the gender differences that have been discussed aren't really real? What kind of data would you want? Well, first of all, you'd want to look at long-term relationships. Say in long-term relationships, in real established relationships, are there differences in the implications of physical appearance, gender differences in the implications of physical appearance? Uh, as long as you're trying to do this work right, you'd say, well, we want to get objective measures of appearance. Another issue in some of the work on physical appearance in relationships is that the person rating the relationship is the same as the person rating a physical appearance. Well, there's a problem there. For anyone who's in a relationship, you know that if you're in love with somebody, they often appear very, very attractive to you in a way that uh, objective people outside your relationship might not appreciate. So we would want our, the measure of, the, on the other hand, it's not easy, it's not hard, excuse me, to get people to agree on somebody's ratings of physical appearance. It's easy to get those ratings reliable objectively, but we're not objective in rating the physical appearance of our own partners. So we'd want objective ratings, and that's not, not always been the case. Um, <clears throat> there's some reason to believe that my reaction, and this is sort of a question you were kind of getting at, that my reaction to a partner's physical appearance might be affected by my own physical appearance. So you'd really, it would be nice to have work data from couples to be able to control for the effect of my physical appearance on my reaction to your physical appearance. Like if there's some kind of disparity, that might be different. If, if I'm lucky enough to marry someone above my league or somehow below my league, you'd want to be able to adjust for that. That might matter. So you want dyadic data, data from both people in a couple. It'd be nice to have longitudinal data to be able to say that this stuff actually predicts outcomes over time. And you'd want to control for confounds, too. So <coughs> we'd want to know that if we're trying to look at the effects of physical attractiveness, that they're not, that the, it's not just an age effect. You want to say, no, this is really that I prefer someone or I have a preference for someone who's pretty or handsome, not just someone who's younger or older. Uh, furthermore, I'd want, to, I'd want to control for some kind of social status that maybe I'm, it's not a preference for people who are well put together. It's a f preference for some kind of physical features. You see the difference? So for us, years of education is a proxy for that sort of thing. And finally, there is some evidence that there's personality differences between the attractive and the less attractive. The attractive are known to score a little bit higher in uh, extroversion. You would be extroverted too. If people are constantly fawning on you, asking out on dates, that, uh, that opens up. You're like, oh, well, might as well be extroverted. Who's going to reject me? I'm so damn hot. But um, people who are less fortunate, less, less gifted physically, um, uh, are less extroverted because they have less, uh, presumably because they've had less experience throughout their lives of people coming up to you and wanting your opinion. Yes, Dan. So just another uh, design, positive or important to this, uh, separate from the question of aspiration level, um, is the question of immediate feedback. So in the speed dating context, right, 
individuals may say in advance, I want practice is very important, but then they get feedback as a function, since there's a distribution of physical attractiveness in both sexes, right? Mm -hmm. They get feedback. The majority of individuals will get feedback from the most attractive members of the opposite sex that's telling them that their expected return on investment is low. Interesting. But now you're asked, would you like to see this person again? You say, well, no, because it would be a waste of time because, you know, I already got the feedback that tells me it's not useful for me. And you're not going to have that when the couples have already formed. Very interesting point. I totally agree. Totally agree. I really like that idea. Uh, and <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the sort of broader literature, on attraction and mate selection, what I mean, the, what the 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 Eastwick the 2008 paper begs the question: If people's a priori preferences didn't predict who they wanted to see at the end of the experience, it begs the question: Well, what did predict? And um, consistent with your intuition, what it is predicting is the nature of the interaction. Is that uh, regardless of how attractive you are, if you sort of express interest in me and make you feel good and laugh at my jokes, that's very, very appealing. But this resolves that problem because these are people who have already met, are already, uh, I mean, in established relationships. The question is, does it still matter? And there's even a broader issue, which is, in an established, we, we, in an established relationship, should it still matter? You know, I've already chosen you. We're together. Uh, maybe what matters now is your inner qualities. Maybe I, I, I see beyond the surface, and I'm reacting to you as a partner and helpmate in life, and not so much to the shape of your uh, the shape in, of your body and clarity of your skin. Well, it so happens that if you would agree, if you're with me so far, that this would be a very nice uh, design. It so happens, it's a crazy coincidence. I happen to have a lot of this kind of data. Um, in fact, we have four studies that we could address that we've collected over the years. Which had where we had access to this kind of data. So my general uh, research interest is in the development and maintenance of newlywed marriage. So I study the first years of newlywed marriages, and I've done this a lot over the years with me uh, and my students. And uh, we have over the over time collected four independent samples of newlywed couples, and they all we had we had observational data in all four of those studies. So we actually had pictures, and in, some, in most cases, videotapes, of all the people in these studies shortly after they were married. And what we were able to do was draw from the data we had. We had data on their longitudinal outcomes. We knew their gender. We had data on the controls. All we needed to obtain was ratings of the physical attractiveness of every one of those studies. So over time, we got that done. And uh, this, because the studies were all conducted very similarly, not identically, but very similarly, we were able to, to make a first pass at this by collapsing across our four independent samples. In everything that I'm about to tell you, we entered dummy codes for study. They never predicted anything, like not even close. So, so the effects that I'm about to describe to you uh, replicated across all four samples, and I'm just going to collapse across the four samples and get a lot of power. It's a nice, big sample. So uh, to tell you that how generally this research was conducted, we recruit, in all four of those studies, we recruited newlywed couples through marriage licenses and advertisements in like bridal shops and things like that. And uh, we've studied, we looked, is there a difference? there's no difference, in, there's no recruitment effect. Like whether, they get, we, whether we contacted them through the marriage license or they respond to an ad, there's no, that never affects anything. We get the same kind of people through both. We are studying only first married newlywed couples. So there's no remarriages, no stepkids here. Uh, and in these four samples, they're, they're pretty homogeneous in terms of the samples. They're, they're basically college-educated, mostly white, mostly middle-class couples. In recent years, we've moved into studying more diverse samples and made a real effort to study low-income samples and uh, minority samples, and that's where our work is now. But these, these data sets are on mostly college-educated, middle-class white people, like most of social psychology. And um, the design was the same. We contacted them within six months of their, of their wedding and uh, asked them a bunch of baseline questions, invited them to come into our labs for observational recording. We would record them interacting or in, some, in some of these studies. And then every six months, we contact them again and ask them a number of questions, among which is, hey, how is your marriage going? You know, basically giving them standard marital satisfaction inventories every six months. 
Now, so here's what we did to assess physical appearance. For, to, we wanted to know objectively, from an outsider's perspective, how, attract, how physically attractive were all of these 900 people. So we got, in, in, for each of those four samples, a different set of research assistants. It was not the same research assistant uh, studying all of them. But it was a small group rating, changing from, I think, uh, three people rating all the photos in a study to nine people rating all the photos in a study. And we asked them to rate faces on a 1 to 10 scale, where 10 is you know, supermodel, and 1 is elephant man, and a 5 is just you know, moderate person. Uh, in study 1, 2, and 3, we didn't have photographs. We had videotapes. So what we did in that, in that study, we had videotapes. And the way we do the videotapes is that uh, it's a split screen. So you see the husband and the wife's face. They were facing each other in the room, but they're split on the, on the screen. And uh, we were aware that research shows very much that my rating of one partner's attractiveness is affected by my awareness of the attractiveness of the other partner. So if you have a partner who's really attractive, people will look at you and think that you are more attractive, a halo effect for your partner's attractiveness. Well, we didn't want that. So we actually just put a curtain over half the screen and had our researcher subjects uh, rate all the husbands without looking at any of the wives, and then rate all the wives without looking at any of the husbands. And basically the idea was that they would turn on the videotape and push pause within the first two or three seconds you know, when someone's frozen in a, in a sort of standard pose, you don't want anyone like frozen like in a weird pose. And once you've got a good picture, look at it, make the rating, move on to the next tape. So husbands and wives were rated independently. The reliability was more than adequate for all the ratings. This is not hard to do. Uh, you, you, it said beauty is in the, high, in the eye of the beholder. That's nah, not really true. It turns out that there's a lot of cross-cultural agreement in what kind of people are more attractive than others. And then we had our self-report measures of satisfaction. Uh, all four studies had the same measure of marital satisfaction, the quality marriage index. And we had our covariates. All four studies had the same covariates. We knew their age. We knew their years of education. And we uh, had their extroversion scores down. What are the participants' incentives to participate? Yeah, these participants were paid to participate, yes. It varied somewhat from study to study because of uh, differences in kind of the cost of getting people to come in. But just a moderate fee from, let's say, <coughs> Uh, I think the first time, the first assessment was that they would get between fifty and seventy-five dollars for coming in, and some comparable fee for all, every subsequent wave that they came in. But they were totally paid to come in, uh, and they didn't come in every time. So in all these studies, people would come in, and then they would do some through the, through the mail, and then they'd come in. Some most of the time, they came in one more time for an observation. So the question is: there's, Since we have this longitudinal data, we can ask two questions about how the physical appearance, the objectively rated physical appearance of each partner was associated with the satisfaction of the marriage. And uh, one is that our dependent variable is a trajectory of satisfaction over time. So we have eight assessments of marital satisfaction, which gives you a line. You can actually plot a line for each individual. And you can characterize that line on two, with two parameters or two dimensions. You can characterize the height of the line the inter, which is captured by the intercept. So some people are just always happier. They have a high intercept. Some people are just always less happy. They have a low intercept. Or you can look at an effect on the slope of that line. Some people are maintaining their satisfaction. It's flat. Some people might be increasing. Most people over the new years sort of decline. And the question is, if I control for the covariates, and I control for my own physical attractiveness, how much does the trajectory of my marital satisfaction in an established real marriage, how much is it affected by my partner's satisfaction, and is there gender differences in that effect? That's the question. Uh, first of all, just, this is just some descriptives, just so you see what the data look like. Um, you'll notice that on a scale of 1 to 10, this is the mean attractiveness of the husbands across the four studies. So the people who are spending their time are a for average, a tiny bit below average in physical appearance. And the wives are the same. There's no significant gender differences between the ratings of husbands and ratings of wives in any study. And there is a significant correlation 
between the husbands and wives attractiveness ratings in, in every study. And that's a very widely uh, replicated finding. Like this is just a replication of a well-established finding that in real romantic relationships, people tend to be relatively well-matched in their physical appearance. Yes? Did you say where these studies were located? I didn't, but I can. Study one and study two were both conducted at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. Study three was conducted at, um, in Ohio, Mansfield, Ohio. Study four was conducted at the University of Tennessee. So it's possible that, had we, so study, it's, it's interesting that study two sort of jumps out as slightly more attractive, but it was conducted the same place as study one. And perhaps we'd flatter ourselves by saying if we'd done the study in Los Angeles, there'd be you know, much higher because people are so attractive here. That's why I got them. Totally, totally. <laughs> if I'd done it in this room, super high, I'm just looking at you. <laughs> but basically, the idea being that these are, what's also another, I didn't say this, but it's worth noting that these are pretty well distributed variables. You, know, you do get in all of these samples a pretty nice range of physical attractiveness for the men and the women. Uh, and, you know, centered right around the midpoint of the scale. So that's, that's pretty good. We didn't get any tens according to our physical rate, and no ones either. So there's no extremes. If you're extreme, you don't show up for these kind of studies. <laughs> so let's, um, let's look first at the results on the levels. Okay, so the question is that when you institute all these controls, you're controlling for everything, you look at real couples, do you get it? Do you get a gender difference? And, or do you get, first of all, do you get, there's really two questions here. Do you get an effect at all? Does physical appearance actually matter, controlling for all that other stuff? Does the way you look affect how satisfied you are in your marital relationship? And the answer is, uh, it does if you're a man. So a couple things to note about this. The ratings of husband's attractiveness didn't predict anything significantly. Now, you'll notice the direction of the effect's kind of interesting. It's not significant. I don't want to spend too much time talking about a not significant effect. But it is negative, but it's just not significant because there's too much variability. But so husbands, husbands, uh, let me put it another way. Husbands, physical appearance had no association with their own satisfaction or their wives' satisfaction uh, out in terms of intercept, sort of the level. But wives' appearance predicted husbands' level. But that's a constant effect. It means that when husbands were married to more attractive wives, they were happier at the start, and they stayed happy. They were always happier than husbands married to less attractive wives. And this was the same was not true for wives. So husbands' attraction didn't, weigh, didn't predict wives' satisfaction. Husbands' ratings didn't predict wives' satisfaction. And the difference between those, uh, those co coefficients is statistically significant. If you sort of constrain them to be equal, that test is significant. So, Husbands are indeed, in this study, significantly more affected by their wives' attractiveness than vice versa. And, and, and it's in the predicted direction. Husbands are happier with more attractive wives. Controlling for this effect, yeah, Dan. Does it bother you that the wife's attractiveness doesn't predict the wife's satisfaction despite having a happier husband? Well, it's interesting. It doesn't predict her level. Okay, um, it would bother me if it weren't for this. So if you, predict this, if you look at the slopes now, so this is now rates of change. Suddenly, there you get the prediction of wife satisfaction. So now I'm predicting controlling for the effects on level that I just showed you, controlling for all of that table. Are there any additional effects on rates of change in satisfaction over time? And now you get an effect only for wives. It's not significantly different from everything else, but it's the only one that reaches significance. And what's the effect? The effect is that more attractive wives are able to maintain their happiness longer. So this is a slope effect. It means that they don't decline as much. Another way of saying it is the less attractive wives decline more. I think this is the effect that Dan was thinking about. So if you put the two things together, what do you get? You get husbands, when they're, more, when they're married to, what's happening to a husband who's married to a more attractive wife? He's real happy, and he just stays constantly happier than everybody else. And his wife, doesn't start out happier, but she ends up staying happier because she, presumably because she's married to a happier guy. So, so summary so far, husbands are more satisfied in marriages to more attractive wives. That's across four studies, almost 1,000 people, almost 500 couples. That's a powerful um, 
piece of data. And this is true controlling for my own attractiveness, controlling for age, like other kind of confounds. It's not an age effect. It's not that I'm happy when my wife is younger. It's not that I'm happy when my wife is smarter or more educated. It's not, when I, it's not about her personality. It's about the, for physical appearance as rated by objective raters. And more attractive wives stay happier over time. They don't start out happier, but ma they maintain what happiness they have, presumably because they got satisfied husbands. Question. So uh, I was just wondering about the shape of these curves, because you said they weren't significant, but I'm looking at the data on the, on Let's the go back. graph. The one before that, right? So, so there's a negative, a small negative effect size over there um, of your own attractiveness. Is, that, is the interpretation of that, if I'm more attractive, I'm yeah, that's, I mean, it's not significant, but yes. Not, not significant, right. But then, so does that mean that, I mean, one, one interpretation that's different than what you're saying, but I guess it depends on what the curve looks like, is an attractive woman um, is less satisfied with her relationship, but gets more satisfied over time because, well, there could be various reasons why that might be. Could. Uh, that's a little bit different than. It is different, but I don't think that's, that's true. Not, I don't think that's true. What's true is that, and that early on, her attractiveness does not predict where she is. But it, it, uh, over time, her attractiveness predicts where she is. So, early, so what, like it's the people, and I'll show you a figure that makes this clear a little bit later. Okay. Uh, so we'll come back to that. So uh, that's where we are so far. Uh, and it raises, the, so that's, again, I've spent 45 minutes trying to bring you back to what you probably believed when you walked in, which is, yeah, so there are gender differences in uh, and husbands, you know, men like physical attractiveness more. Thanks a lot. But I think we can dig deeper. Like, this is the kind of data that allow us to, a little, to dig a little bit deeper and say, well, what's going on? What actually is happening in these couples? We've got a lot of process data here. And we can ask some questions that allow us to pull this effect apart in a way that hasn't been done before. So if we're going to dig a little deeper, we might ask, what is it that makes marriages more successful for more attractive wives? Again, it's not the husband's appearance at all. It doesn't seem like it. And uh, the obvious answer is to look at behavior, to look at the actual dyadic processes as they're affected by the physical appearance of the partners. And we might expect, what's the hypothesis? The, the hypothesis is that if I'm a man and I'm in a relationship with uh, an attractive wife, a more physically attractive wife, that is her attractiveness is a resource I care about that I should be motivated to try to protect by making her happy. And so that should be manifested in behavior somehow. The other issue that we didn't look at before, that no one's looked at before, is the interaction between the two partners' attractiveness. So to get the effect that I told you before, we just sort of looked at the main effect of husbands and wives as if they were independent and controlling for any correlation between them. But they're not independent. In fact, there's an interaction effect that has never been looked at before, uh, but that we, has, we've been talking about, which is maybe my reaction to your attractiveness depends in some way on my own attractiveness. You can imagine how that might be. In fact, there's two ways that it might go. And, and one interaction effect, these are both interaction of two different kinds of interactions between two partners of physical attractiveness. And one would be a simple similarity effect. Oh, life goes well, better when we're similar when we're well matched. We know that on, on average, couples are well matched. The question is, does that, is it good to be well matched? If I'm better matched, I manage to find someone whose objective people think is the same attractiveness as I am, is that good? And to test that, you basically look at some kind of absolute value of the difference between the partner's attractiveness. And you say, does that predict these outcomes? But that's not the only possible interaction that you could test. Another possibility is, that it's not the absolute value of the difference, but it's the signed value of the difference. So imagine you're a husband who, in the story we're telling, cares a lot about physical attractiveness. A simple similarity effect would say, I'm unhappy the farther away you are from me in attractiveness. Well, what if you're way more attractive than me? Like, that would be a difference. But that would be a difference that would be, you are actually, I feel over benefit. Like I'm actually getting a lot of something I actually care about. You're very attractive. And you can easily imagine that that might actually be a good thing. That there's some differences that would be good differences. Basically a difference in the favorite direction, which is I don't mind if I'm not attractive. I don't mind being less attractive than you. I just want you to be more attractive than me. 
So that would be a different kind of interaction. Again, the difference being this is an absolute value of the difference, and this is the signed value of the difference. This says any difference is bad, and this says no, some differences are probably pretty awesome. If you're, if you're a guy and you're married to someone who you think is more attractive than you, or other people think is more attractive than you, that might be quite rewarding, actually. So we tested that, but in only one of the stu studies. <coughs> uh, I'm not going to belabor this point, but uh, this, is, this is the point I was just making. There's actually a number of theoretical reasons why you might expect that the relative difference would, would be more important than the absolute difference, and the signed value of the difference. So for example, equity theory, a theory of relationship says that people are sensitive to, am I getting what I'm giving? Am I, am I getting uh, outcomes in this relationship that are commensurate with the investments I'm making in the relationship? Normative resource theory says that when, in thinking about equity, I pay more attention to resources and investments that are important to me. So if you apply that to relationships, you'd say, well, I care about whether I'm getting what I deserve in terms of something I care about. And if I'm a man, that's physical attractiveness. If I'm a woman, I should not be monitoring equity on physical attractiveness. I don't care how physical. I, I want other things for my partner. I'm generalizing, of course. So all of this leads to the hypothesis that husbands should be most engaged, most motivated to make their partners happy when they feel over-benefited when they feel like they're getting a good deal, in other words, when their wives are more physically attractive than they are, controlling for everything else. So that's what we studied. We went back to study one, uh, which had exactly the data we were looking for. So this is the N of 82. So now we're a much smaller sample, but just you know, one of the four studies. But we had observational data at time one, which was a social support interaction. So the social support interaction is where you ask couples to come in, once they're in the lab, to identify something that they're working on to change in their own lives. Not a marital issue. We also videotape them talking about marital issues. But that's, not this, that's, that's a conflict problem which we thought would engage different processes. The process here that we cared about was, how much do you help your partner do what your partner wants to do? So uh, we videotape them. They're talking to each other. They're engaging these in two interactions, one on a topic of his choosing and one on a topic of her choosing. But the truth is that their behaviors are highly correlated across these interactions. Like some of these couples just are engaging in behavior effectively. They're communicating effectively according to objective coding of these tapes. And some couples are communicating less effectively. So the reliability was high and, uh, if we just combined the behavioral codes across their two interactions. So we basically got a single index that captured how successful they were at communicating versus how unsuccessful they were at communicating. And what we wanted to do was predict the quality of an interaction, controlling for their marital satisfaction, and controlling for the main effect of each spouse's satisfaction, and then looking specifically at the interaction effect. Does, is there an effect on this behavior of either their similarity or the uh, relative attractiveness. So what did we find? What we found was no similarity effect at all. That the absolute value of the difference did not predict the behavior. It's not that people are sensitive to, look, oh, I, I'm, I'm, effective, I'm communicating better when we're on the same page in terms of attractiveness. But we found significant effects for the relative attractiveness. The sign difference didn't predict behavior. By the way, the reason that I didn't we're not presenting numbers here, is that there's some controversy about how to look at different scores, how to do statistics when what you're interested in conceptually is a, is a different score. The way to do it, I could spend quite a few minutes telling you that the, the, the best way to look at a different score as a predictor is it requires like four or five different steps, and you sort of infer the value of the, the predictive value of the different score from these five steps. I'm not going to tell you what they are right now. I will tell you that when you just enter the main effects of each partner's attractive and the raw difference, you actually get the same results, in this case, as you do when you, take, when you do the multiple steps. And the effect is this. Couples interacted more effectively when wives were more attractive than their husbands, and to the extent that wives were more attractive than their husbands, and less effectively when husbands were more attractive than their wives. So there was a significant difference between those two groups. When husbands were more attractive, they were 
less engaged, and their, the interactions, the communication in the couple was less effective, according to objective listeners, than when the wife was more attractive. And this holds true controlling for all the other main effects and controlling for marital satisfaction. So what, what do we make of that? Make of that that, in fact, in these, hold on one second, that in these, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, you're watching them too. Okay. Yeah, these are videotapes. So the people judging the attractiveness are aware of their attractiveness. That's a good point. Now, these are not the same people who are rating attractiveness, but it is true, absolutely. The people who are judging this communi these communication are aware. Now, the, we have code books for coding these interactions that are really detailed, and these people will really receive a lot of training, a lot more than the physical attractiveness raters. We just said, look, you know, scale of 1 to 10, you know what it is. You know what attractive is. But these people were coding the behaviors really specifically according to a very lengthy code book. It's possible that those codes, it's even maybe even likely that those codes could have been affected by their perceptions of the, how attractive the people were that were speaking. But we do everything possible to minimize that. Question? Just out of curiosity, did you happen to collect all the data from the you know, confidential questionnaire oh. part of uh, incremental results? Not in this study. We are asking that in, a, in another study right now on, on, uh, on a different kind of sample. But in here, we didn't ask. And it's interesting. Uh, what's, your, what's your intuition? What, what leads you to ask? Well, what, what led me to ask is here if a husband, well, yeah. approximate reason for my asking here is the, the, the reference to the husbands being more attractive than their wives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it. I totally see it. That when the husbands are more attractive than their wives, you would think that would predict um, more opportunity, more interest in possibly adultery. Uh, let, and the flip side of that coin would be true, less commitment to the current relationship. Because I feel underbenefited with something with respect to a dimension that really matters to me. I get that. I think that's a very plausible hypothesis. We didn't measure that here. So <clears throat> this is a step beyond. OK, yes, please, Joe. Um, you get a big five inventory, right? Did yes. any of the other, did you look for effects of any of the other dimensions? Because one could imagine that neuroticism would that is, if, if, if someone who feels that they're um, so going to workplace, that they're overbenefited, um, and and would be more worried that their their spouse has other prospects that are better than them, and that that would be especially accentuated in people who are neurotic. Neurotic. We did not look at neuroticism, but my under, my understanding of the prior literature is that the best evidence was for a link between attractiveness and extroversion, so sort of sociability. And there wasn't, I wasn't aware of any, I'm still unaware of any data that links neuroticism to attractiveness. So we were looking at things that might be confounds. And so it, it, rather than go on to fishing, you know, like we didn't want to look too broadly. We wanted to be more focused, and extroversion was the best bet for a personality confound. But I don't, I'm not, don't think that your hypothesis is unreasonable. It's just we didn't test it. So, um, <clears throat> so far, all of the data, all of the attractiveness is based on headshots. Or, and even in our videos, the video camera is focused on people sort of from the shoulders up. But we know that in addition to being reactive to people's facial attractiveness, physical appearance is also about you know, your body shape and your weight. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence that weight is so strongly associated with physical appearance, uh, ratings of physical appearance, perceptions of physical appearance and much more so for women than for men. That 2006 paper is a review paper that looks at it. Weight, uh, furthermore, has strong associations with attraction and relationship formation, which is to say that in, in kind of the dating studies that I have moved beyond, but that we're telling you about a moment ago, uh, people, are very, people are very, very sensitive to the weight of a potential date. And basically, thinner is better. People don't want to date people who are overweight. In established relationships, though, so now, so as Dan pointed out, there's a, there's a difference, as we're pointing out this whole time, there should be a difference between the effect of these variables in uh, mate formation versus the effect of these variables in uh, relationship maintenance in an established relationship. And in fact, the data on the effects of weight, the associate, let me put it another way, the associations between weight and relationship outcomes in real relationships, in established relationships, has been quite inconsistent. Some studies say, hey, thinner partners are happier. Thinner couples are happier than heavier couples. Some studies have said, oh, you know, there's no association. 
There's, the weight is not, so, once you're in a relationship, your relationship is predicted by other things, it's not predicted by weight. And some people have said, oh, there's a main effect such that heavier partners are actually happier. It's better. It's, you're, I mean, that's not causal. Of course, the idea, by the way, in this the, uh, written in this last study, is that if you're in a satisfied relationship, you're totally committed to your partner. Well, you can sort of relax a little bit. <laughs> you know, she's not going nowhere. You got the, and so you don't have to you know, go to the gym every day because your partner already likes you. Who do you who are you trying to attract? That's at least that was the theory in that particular. Book. So um, <clears throat> that's interesting that the data are so inconsistent. You might wonder why. But the kind of analyses that I've been suggesting to you today might give us an answer. That it might not, we, we might get a, the picture might be confusing because you look at the main effects of each person's weight. But in fact, couples are not affected by my weight and independently by your weight, but by our weight. But by the match or the difference between my weight and your weight. And in an established relationship, it might be the relative weight, as we were showing that the relative facial attraction is, it might be the relative weight that matters most. And again, if it does matter most, there should be a gender difference. Men are indeed, A, men care more about weight, actually flipping the order, men care, say they care more about weight in their female partners than females care about weight in their male, male partners. And furthermore, the standards of weight for men are looser than for women. So men are considered attractive in a broader span of weight than women are. That's not the way I would want it to be. That's not just, but it is the way it seems to be. So uh, if we try to extend this work, yes? I don't know if this is possibly a confounding issue. Have you, is there research that, that suggests that partners tend to weight match? Yes. I don't know if it's a confounding issue either, but it, they generally do. In the same way, they tend to match on physical attractiveness. So the, the, the no, no, I mean once they enter to converge. Yeah, they, they, the, yeah, once they're in, once they've entered into the marriage, then there tends to be some type of convergence towards. And the answer to that is again yes, yes. And you, know, it's not hard to imagine why. Suddenly, well, I'm not living in my house, and you're living in your house. We have one kitchen, one lifestyle. So we're likely to either we exercise a lot together or we don't exercise a lot together. There's many forces that would lead us to converge in weight. The qu one question that I isn't, isn't answered as far as I know is uh, who has more influence on that convergence? Does the heavier partner bring the thinner partner down or, or up? Uh, or does the thinner partner exert a good influence or do they meet in the middle? I'd love to see that data and I don't have it. So we can make hypotheses that are consistent with what we talked about before, that relative weight, just as it predicts for husbands, husbands care about it and prefer when their wives are more attractive, to, uh, attractive than them, relative weight should predict both partners' relationship satisfaction over time, initial satisfaction and changes, and both spouses should be happier eventually to the extent that wives are thinner than their husbands. So the idea basically is, can we generalize from the findings on facial attractiveness, does it generalize to weight. So with this time we went to study two. We didn't have weight data in all the studies, but we did have it in study two. This is the largest study, 169, just about twice the size of the prayer of study one, uh, where we asked them to report on their height and weight, from which we could compute BMI. Now, would it, be, would it have been nicer to uh, weigh them ourselves, because we know that people lie about their weight? It would have been nicer, yes. A little bit intrusive, though. It's because uh, so we have a you know, large self-report inventory, many, many pages of self-report measures. And one of them included, tell us about your health, tell us about your current height and weight. Their height didn't change much. Their weight did. And so then we could compute, again, using the difference score. We could compute the absolute value of the difference between my body mass index and your body mass index. And I could compute the relative difference, the sort of the signed difference. Are you heavier than me, or is your body mass index higher than mine, or lower than mine, or are we just about the same? So what did we find? Uh, I'm going to show you three lines. This is the relative weight and husband's marital satisfaction. So I'm going to show you the entire trajectory. Yes, Dad. So there, I, I, I'm guessing that this is a, a limitation that's just intrinsic to the data, but to the extent that male attractiveness is a function of muscularity, BMI is an imperfect measure. Weight to height ratio due to body fat and weight to height ratio due to muscle mass. 
That's absolutely true. It is a limitation of BMI, uh, as Dan points out, that, that uh, you can have a high BMI because you're overweight, and, uh, or you can have a high BMI because you're in fantastic physical shape and you've got a lot of muscle. <clears throat> For what it's worth, there weren't too many people who were in fantastic physical shape uh, in this study from having done the physical, uh, from looking at the videos. But uh, that's true. That is an inherent limitation, absolutely. So uh, in the, to present the results before, I showed you the intercepts, data for the intercepts, and then data for the slope separately. Now I'm just going to plot the intercepts. So you can just see them. I think this is going to help answer some of your questions. That um, the, there was a significant effect on the intercept for husbands and not on the slopes. And this is what this means. So that's the decline in satisfaction over time for the couples who were, mat who were equal in their BMI, where the husband and wife are about equal. Within a like within some very small range. The husbands who were heavier than their wives were always happy, and always happy to the same degree. They were always happier than the guys who were matched, and the people, the husbands who were less happy than their wives were always less happy. It's not a giant effect, but it's a significant effect. B is less than 0.01. And it's a constant effect. They're not, it's not that there's something changing over time. The, pe the men who are married to thinner wives than themselves, the men who are heavier than their husbands, they're just always happier than everybody else in the sample. And who are these guys? Think about uh, the truth is that, that um, our media culture is full of examples that match that top line. right? Take a look at Fred Flintstone. Take a look at Wilma. There's a different silhouette there. And there's just many, many, many examples of guys in the media who are, you know, heavier than their wives is the point. And they're happy as clams. So um, what about the wives? Well, this is, again, a similar effect to what we saw before, on a but it's a different sample. That uh, <clears throat> here there's an effect for wives on the slope. It's an effect that emerges over time. So there's the, the wives who are matched to their husbands. There's the wives who are less heavy than their husbands. And they're the wives who are more heavy than their husbands. So what's the difference? Right at the beginning, their wives are not affected. The wives are, are equally satisfied no matter what their relative weight is. And by the way, there was no, there's no similarity effect here. Again, it's a relative effect only. At the beginning of the marriage, year zero, when they're just newlyweds, their weight and their relative weight does not distinguish. It emerges over time. So what's the driving force? I didn't study what specifically is the driving force, but it's not hard to tell the story that, well, over time, the, the even though they're not affected immediately, the husbands were affected immediately. And over time, it's good to be married to a happy husband who's happy with your weight. Then. And is this based on the BMI differentials at time zero, not at time four? That's correct. The BMI dif differentials at time zero, not at time four. BMI in the sample was relatively stable. Although we have another paper we looked at, we did analyze fluctuations as a function of other things in the marriage. It's a, sort of a different analysis. But um, that's right. It's based on your, your zero. Correct, correct. No, this is based on, on year zero. So it's the year zero relative difference that's predicting over time. So, uh, so what have we got? What are the, what are the implications of this? And I'm, I'm wrapping up here. Well, first of all, there's a, there's, a, there's a friend of mine who studies political science says, if, you, if you're shooting at the king, shoot to kill. Uh, in this case, if you're going to say that conventional wisdom about gender differences in the importance of physical attractiveness are, are false or misguided, well, you know, better be sure that you've looked, you've given the conventional wisdom a, a fair shot. And if you're going to look for gender differences in the role of attractiveness in relationships, look for where the theory predicts you're going to find them, which isn't in dating, it isn't in short-term mating, it's in long-term mating. And here I've told you results from uh, different kinds of results from four different studies, all of which show in, in that in long-term ongoing relationships, you get exactly the effect that is predicted. And that's consistent with what people say in their self-reports about what they want from long-term relationships. But we haven't only propped up the conventional wisdom. There's, um, I think, a, a point to make here, a takeaway point about the importance of looking at dyadic variables with a sensitivity to the dyadic relationship. That um, in, in the latter two studies that I described to you, the main effects of my attractiveness and your attractiveness were dwarfed and, in fact, eliminated when you actually pointed out the dyadic relationship. 
I don't think I said so, but if you actually compared the main effect directly to the effect of the difference, the effect of the difference carries the day. What matters most in a dyad is not how I compare to people in the world, it's how I compare to my partner. And think about that. When I'm dating somebody, if I'm considering someone as a date, who do I compare that person to in terms of their physical appearance? Well, I compare them to all the other possible dates I might have, who, which is to say to the world. So it makes sense that the absolute value of your attractiveness matters. But in my relationship, who am I comparing you to now? Well, now what matters is how we compare to each other. Because once we have some interdependence, we evaluate each other. What seems to be true is that we're, we're, we're sensitive to the, evaluate, the comparison between us. So the way we evaluate our long-term partners is different and more dyadic than the way we evaluate short-term partners. And there's a bright side, and this is what I want to leave you with. You know, we, can't, we aren't all tens. Um, most of us are not tens. But the implication of this work, in terms of relative appearance and relative attractiveness and relative weight, is that it's possible, I mean, the, the concern when doing work like this is that you're, sen you're supporting the, a sort of a patriarchy and evil standards of female beauty, which I don't want to do. But what you can say is, one thing that comes out of this is, it's not how attractive you are, it's not how thin you are, it's how you match in the couple. And it says that uh, there's a good match for anybody, uh, and that it doesn't matter what you look like or how much you weigh, what matters is that you look a little bit um, better than your male partner. And that's all I have for you today. These are the people who, I, who funded the work that you just described. And here are the people who I worked on it with. And I'm happy to take questions.